Hello everyone, and today is another special addition to the podcast because we have another very special guest. Um, we're going to jump right into his channel and I'm going to let him introduce himself. He is the man behind the channel Popcorn Lobotomy and I'll have links to his channel down below. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself. Say hello. Uh, hello to the audience. Uh, should I say my name? I'm Harvey from uh, Popcorn Lobotomy. I do the crazy uh, rant videos about movies um and uh hurt my voice a lot while i do it <laughs> yeah uh we're gonna i'm we're gonna talk about your channel uh in depth but before we get into that i'm probably gonna ask some of the like standard youtube questions like how you get got into youtube okay and stuff like that uh so uh basically what made you start your channel and why did you choose like these very uh specific type of movie reviews well, um, a few different things all came together, I guess. I've always wanted to do something on YouTube, you know, like it was always an interest of mine. Um, I was learning motion graphics and video work and trying to move into a career in that, so it seemed like a good time to use those skills. Um, and in, at the same time, um, in 2009, me and a couple of friends started a blog called Popcorn Lobotomy, which was the same idea, basically just movie reviews uh that were all negative about really crap movies basically that we hated you know like I, we didn't bother with positive reviews they're all just every movie that we hated uh we would write a blog about it and we did quite a few i don't know what the the final number was but we did quite a few uh reviews yeah. um yeah hence the title yeah the... so we had the title there yeah. um and yeah when i looked at doing youtube stuff i was sort of thinking about a lot of things and i started a couple of different shows and other ideas and they're all kind of difficult and I wasn't really ready for them and I thought you know that movie review blog I could just read out the the blog I wouldn't even need to write anything new you know it'd be really easy so I thought I'll, I'll try that and this was maybe three years ago um, I sat down and I got my uh, Canon camera out and I got a uh, teleprompter and I printed out a review and I read it to camera and it was the worst thing I've ever seen when I watched it back. It was just horrible. Like, <laughs> like people watch YouTube videos and they're very critical about the presenters, you know, because they, they go, oh, you know, the audio is bad or uh, he pauses and says, um, too much or things like that. Right. I did all of those things. Mm. I did every single one. That's why I really appreciate, you know, YouTubers like you, because you speak to camera and you sound natural um, and, and you're actually mm. engaging. And I looked back on mine and I was like, I can't do this. I didn't realize, but I cannot do it. And uh, I just basically gave up on the idea at that point and went, you know, that's maybe something for the future when I've developed a personality or something. <laughs> um, and then um, later on, I, I kept thinking about it because I really wanted to do it. And I liked the idea and I love the name Popcorn Lobotomy. I think it can encompass a lot of different things. And I think it really expresses, you know, like, how bad Hollywood's become or the movie industry in general has become and how formulaic it is these days with all the uh, comic book movies and so on. Um, and the other problem mm. was I, I did a, a, another, I try, tried to start another YouTube channel that didn't involve my voice or my face. Um, and mm. I put up, it was basically re-edited footage of other movies, scenes from movies. And when I put it up, I realized um, it gets copyright strikes because so everything that I did it got taken down. I spent, you know, a day or whatever doing these edits and then it would just get pulled down and I couldn't do anything about it. And I thought, you know, that's not going to work either. So I ended up coming back to Popcorn Lobotomy and I decided I'll do an intro and an outro to camera and that's all. And I'll work out how to record mm -hmm. my voice well first before I put my face on camera because that way I can edit it, uh, you know, and, and take out all the... The, the really bad bits and then I figured you know after doing that maybe I'll be more comfortable in front of camera and I'll be able to do it uh, more fluidly but we'll see about that I'm still not there yet yeah um I try to say it as that as I can my first not my first video but the first time I was on camera there's like a frame where I just look terrified it is <laughs> so painfully awkward and um and that's that happens to everyone. First time you record audio, you're gonna sound awkward. Uh, it's just something you gotta get through. Um, one thing uh, I want to mention is just the quality of your videos, man. Like uh, I can't say it enough. They they are great. Like just your intros, you know, they they they're like mine. They have you know the green screen, 
uh, camera, but your camera, just for your intros alone, your camera and green screen, green screen quality are like way better than mine. And I literally each of your videos that I watched, I laughed like <laughs> aloud by myself. Well, I'm just and a little bit lucky actually when it comes to that because I happen to have a girlfriend who's a professional makeup artist, and. Uh, she doesn't like to spend a lot of time on my stuff because she's trying to be, she's a YouTuber herself. She's doing a beauty channel and she does makeup tutorials mm. and so on. So she's pretty busy. Um, but I can get her to spend an hour doing like makeup and stuff. But for Look, honestly, if you told me two years ago, I'd be putting on like white face makeup and dressing up like Johnny Depp from uh, Alice in Wonderland to do a video. I'd be like, there's no way I, I would just n never do that. But when I look at the videos, I go, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny enough that it justifies the embarrassment of actually doing that. Plus, it also hides, like, you know, if I feel nervous on in front of camera, well, wearing a funny hat kind of makes it a bit easier for some reason. I'm not sure why. I I, I, I message you, uh, like, just, like, the, the quality of the, just the costumes. It, like, like, it adds to just, like, how, like, impressed I was of just the, with everything and... Um, uh, one question, like, you know, like, in each video I've noticed, you have that, like, Illuminati, like, uh... Yeah. Like, the, like, wh where did the inspiration for that come? Because, uh, and, the, and the editing for that, those parts alone are great. Uh, where did that idea come from? Yeah, the, the editing on those parts, uh, I'm getting a bit faster at it, but, uh, the, like, the first video, the editing on, on that part took about as long as the rest of the video, because there's a lot of... Um, mm -hmm. downloads to do, for, you know, I mean, I basically just steal yeah. stuff from Google Images and whatever, but uh, but there's a lot to put in there. Why do I do it? That's a good mm -hmm. question. I mean, really, at the end of the day, I, <laughs> I've i read a lot of conspiracy stuff. I'm a bit of a conspiracy nut, and I had a lot of knowledge about it. But I'm not one of those guys mm -hmm. who's 100% convinced by every conspiracy theory I ever read. But I'm, I'm a writer. I, originally, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Stephen King, basically. So, you know, I, I think of myself as a writer. I think of stories all the time. And I found when I was reading about conspiracy theories or watching conspiracy videos, it really triggered my imagination. It sort of opens your mind to a whole new world of possibilities of these, like, evil elites doing crazy things. And when you look into it, there's mm -hmm. actually, generally, there's a lot of basis behind the conspiracy theories. But because you know, they try to condense the information. It just sounds crazy at first, you know? So um, yeah. I, I had the knowledge, it's an interest of mine, uh, and I thought it was something unique I could bring to the video um, mm. that, that I knew would get, I don't know, it would get some people engaged and it would turn some people off, but I'm okay with that. I, I didn't really want it to be for everybody. So it's something I think, you know, some people just tolerate it and some people watch it just for that. You know, I have a cousin, he just goes, I just love watching the conspiracy rants. I usually skip forward to the to the rant instead of watching the review because I already know what you think about the movie. So, um, I don't know, it's a weird mix, but, but I thought I'll try it out. The other side is, I mean, you know, when you, when you sort of believe in some conspiracy theory stuff, you know, at least things like, you know, the government is evil or something like that, which, you know, I think I do. Um, I generally like to at least put ideas out there. Like if someone decided to pick up a thread from a conspiracy rant and do some research and they found they were convinced by it and it changed the way they think, well, that's a good thing. It's, it brings an extra depth to just doing a movie review about an old movie that everybody knows is crap. You know, I'm only doing it for comedy, really. But at the end of the day, if that happened to trigger a thought in someone's head that they wouldn't have had, well, that's a good thing too. So. Um, I don't know. It may do that. It may not. It's uh, it's kind of like an experimental part, I guess. And I'm not sure how long I can keep it up. There are only so many conspiracy theories out there that you can link to movies. Uh, I was gonna say like just like each one like is different, uh, and there's only so many. But it's like each one like kind of laces with the review. Like each one like oh that kind of explained that theory or that. Uh, uh, they're good segues, and it makes sense. Yeah, there's at least um, a segue. There's a couple of times that it doesn't relate to the movie too much. Like, uh, I think in the mm. Gwyneth Paltrow one, The Perfect Murder, I basically just said there's no way that mm. Gwyneth Paltrow could be an actress unless there was some conspiracy afoot, and then I just go <laughs> into a rant about something else, elite families or whatever, um, which I do believe, by the way. Gwyneth mm. Paltrow is my least favourite actress, and yeah. everything that I say about her, like I say most of the stuff for comedic effect... But about Gwyneth Paltrow, 
I really want to see her get hit in the face with a fry pan. Genuinely, I want to see that. Mm. I loved animating that part. I put a lot of time into it, getting her teeth to fall <laughs> out and the blood to well up in her eye. I animated it very lovingly. So, yeah. I, I, I haven't had the courage to actually tweet directly at Gwyneth Paltrow yet, but I might start doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. She, and, um... she almost ruined my favorite film, Seven, you know? I mean... She was, it was actually, she was okay in that. Like that was probably the, the only tolerable performance she's ever done for me. But um, I hated that she was in there. I was nervous the whole time that she was going to talk in her weasley little voice and ruin the whole movie. And it's such a good movie. Mm. Uh, that, that's great. Um, each of your reviews, uh, they kind of have your own personal opinion in there, right? Like uh, just with the score. Sure. Yeah. Like, even, like, the Mad Max one, like, even though everyone generally likes Mad Max, you had your own, like, opinion, and it, even though uh, people might be like, oh, why is he reviewing it? I thought he only reviews bad movies. You have your own opinion, and that can make it, uh, you know, a good topic, and you you obviously had a lot to say about that. I, I enjoyed the movie, but I could, like, completely understand why you didn't like the movie. Uh... I just wanted more from it. I mean, I, I yeah. don't think it's an unreasonable request to have a little bit more story and character development and stuff. And, you know, that's what I watch movies for. My primary interest is people. Mm. I really find people fascinating. Um, story is also interesting. But for me, it's what the story says about the characters that makes a movie good. You know, I, I mentioned Seven before as an example of one of my favorite movies. Well, Seven is just, it, there's so much depth to the characters. You can watch it 10 times and you keep learning about Brad Pitt's character and Morgan Freeman's character. In Mad Max, you know, he doesn't actually get an opportunity to develop character because there's so much action and mm. mayhem going on. And I know that's enjoyable. I do enjoy the action. And of course, when I do one of these reviews, I play it up a little bit. You know, it's my genuine opinion magnified by, you know, maybe 100% or something. So, you know, it's, I, I did, in, like, I can enjoy Mad Max for what it is. I'm not insane. Obviously, mm. some of the action scenes are just amazing and the visuals are amazing. Um, but I just thought it got too much praise. I was like, well, if we send out a message that this is the best movie ever made, we as a collective audience, mm. then the movie industry is going to respond to that. Can you imagine the movies we're going to get now? Mm. Because they get it wrong when they try and, and, and you know, make a formulaic movie that repeats the success of another one. And as we know, it gets worse and worse generally, you know, in sequels and remakes and all of that, they generally get worse and worse. So what's going to happen with this Mad Max phenomenon? You know, it's winning awards and all that. What is the industry going to do? What are they going to give us? You know, I just, I hate to think about some of these, you know, they're going to be putting in weird details and, and face paint and costumes and, and strange weapons and vehicles. And mm -hmm. cause they think that's what made Mad Max successful, which, I don't think it is. Mm -mm. I think Mad Max was successful because it went for a particular demographic and said, I'm going to put myself a thousand percent into that demographic and not care about anyone else. And it struck a chord with that demographic and the demographic turned out to be way bigger than probably they even imagined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh... So I don't know. I just, I just worry about the message we send. I feel like as an audience, we have a responsibility to give feedback to the industry. And if we give this kind of feedback about Mad Max, it's not that particular movie that I worry about. It's the one that comes next. And not the sequel to Mad Max, by the way, but the other ones that are going to try and copy it, like all the Star Wars copies we got back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I don't think Mad Max, I don't think anyone would have predicted that it would be like winning Oscars left and right and all the success it had. And, you know, yeah. say what you will about the Oscars, but, you know, they do, like, inspire certain companies to make certain movies, like movies like Whiplash and, like, other movies... Uh, the Oscar bait movies, but a lot of those Oscar bait movies have a lot of story, and uh, they the studios at least understand like, hey, we have to make this movie a certain way in order to you know at least get people to watch it and make uh, the certain amount of money. So there are pros and cons to that. But when Mad Max is winning the awards, uh, it does send the wrong message, I think. And uh, I didn't really think about that That's right. uh, until your review. So. Uh, I found that really interesting. One point, though, um, I hate when people compare scores, but you gave Sucker Punch a three. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm only bringing that... Because Sucker Punch has got hot girls yeah, in it. I've, yeah, I was only bringing that up because I felt like it was kind of a similar movie where people mostly just watch it for action and 
uh, cool scenes. But I was just wondering why you gave that one a three, and which neither are really bad, bad scores. Like a two is average to me, a three is like above average to good, at least to me. Yeah, well, the score's out of five, so three's a, a pretty good score. It's about as high as I would go. I think if a movie got a higher than a three, it it's probably not worthy of a popcorn lobotomy yeah. review because obviously they're supposed to be negative. Mm. Um, why? I don't know. I mean, I actually had a, a alternate take of um, the rating at the end, and the only reason I didn't use it was because the quality of the footage was really poor. It just didn't work out. But I essentially, I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how um, how offensive we can be. But anyway, I, this should, I can do this in a non-offensive way. Um, the the shot was of me with a girl's legs either side of the framing me in the camera, and I said uh, sucker punch two stars, and then I looked up. In, up to the skirt, under the skirt of the, the girl standing in front of me, and I went, actually, three stars. <laughs> so that's essentially where it got its extra point from. I did try to explain it, but I couldn't reshoot the footage because I just didn't have time, so I, I, I ended up just not being able to explain it. But it was the basis of a joke. It's, it's really a two-star movie for me. I, you know, that was actually just supposed to be a gag, the three-star thing, but it was, all, it was all rendered in advance, so I had to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a great little Easter egg story. I, I enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long do you, your uh, videos usually take to make, would you say? Um, well, originally I tried to do them weekly, and you probably noticed I dropped them back to once every two weeks, mm -hmm. because I, you know, I, I do I do real work, paid work as well, obviously, and mix it up, so I, I basically have a full-time job to balance out. Mm. And I just realized the quality was going to drop. I did one of them in a week, uh, just to prove that I could do it. I can't remember what episode it was now. And it was okay, but I just felt like I'd, you know, I'd actually cut some stuff just because I didn't have time to do it. And um, I thought, you know, I'd much rather a higher quality one, you know, that has all of the ideas that I can put into it over two weeks. Um, so I think in total, probably like full time days, and we're talking, you know, I generally put in fairly long days, like 12 hours or more when I do it. Mm -hmm. uh, probably four, and probably the most I've ever spent is probably about six. Depending, it really depends how much After Effects work there is. Like, you know, animating the, the fry pan in the face to Gwyneth Paltrow type of stuff takes uh, quite a long time. Mm. So I spend, you know, half a day to a day on some of those shots. So I'm pretty sparing in what I include. And I've started just sort of doing smaller shots and more of them rather than those big special effects shots. But occasionally you just, you know, there's an idea where you just have to do it. Mm. So. Um, it really depends on that. The editing part takes uh, about two days uh, to edit it all together. Um, now, actually, the first first one I did took you know three days or more because it, I did a lot more stuff manually. I learned a few tricks recently that made it a lot easier to do uh, faster edits. So hopefully they'll get faster and faster, and I can go back to a weekly schedule. I don't know. How long do you spend on your videos in in general? Um, mine really depends. Are those like certain cuts that are just gonna take forever? Uh, before it was usually like for every minute would like take an hour, so like a four hour video. Or, I mean, a four minute video would take like four hours. Um, I've really gotten better at like condensing it, and uh, yeah. I I tried to uh, have quantity too, so I like. I want to review like everything like I uh, watch uh, that's actually worth talking about and everything I play because I review more stuff than just movies. So I gotta each YouTuber has to really find their uh, balance of quantity and quality. And um, I think I know. yours like certainly uh, there's a big quality aspect to it. Um, so it really depends. I've had some just take like two hours and you know. Uh, it could have been better, but uh, I was still pretty proud of it. I've had some take like uh, six to twelve hours, um, and sometimes you know you're online as you're editing, and you know when you're online, it can just be a portal of videos and googling stuff. So sometimes it takes longer because I'm all, I, yeah. I'll I'll be one place trying to edit, and then I'm like nowhere near where I'm supposed to be and then I, I'm just like god damn it like why did I do that uh you mentioned uh seven was one of your favorite movies do you have any others that are just like up there for like favorite movie uh yeah I guess I have a bunch um I really like uh for, I don't know Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind comes to mind as just a genius film something 
something I've never seen before, um, done really well. And it's a romantic comedy, you know, like it's not a genre that I'm particularly in love with, but uh, done so well that, that I just, you know, I, I can't help having it in my top 10. Um, I really liked Pi. Have you seen Pi, the Darren Aronofsky film, his debut film? Uh, Pi or Life of Pi? No, Pi. Uh, you know Darren Aronofsky, he did yeah. uh, Requiem for a Dream after that, and then he did the, uh, what is it, The um, the Wrestler and so on, mm -hmm. um, Black Swan. Yeah. I've so, seen um, yeah, that that first movie, if you haven't seen it, go get it. It's, it's a movie, it's about math, it's about religion, it's about every idea, uh, philosophical ideas and just big picture stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's done in such a personal way. It's a fantastic movie. I, I've actually, I, like I'll see a, any Darren Aronofsky movie uh, that he brings out just in case he manages to do something like that again. He hasn't quite managed to recapture that yet, but yeah. um, I feel like he's got that in him somewhere. Yeah. Uh, he's gone a bit mainstream, so I think it's a bit hard for him to, to try and pitch crazy ideas like that. And um, it's inspirational too, because he made that movie for $30,000, getting loans from everybody in his family uh, to to get the uh, enough movie uh, to, uh, enough money to just buy the film the you know the 16 millimeter film to actually shoot the movie and uh, it was a real passion project for him so um, that's one that uh, that I would highly recommend you check out if you haven't seen it um, but yeah there's a bunch I mean you know I, I, I like a pretty like a, there's none that really um, uh, no particular genre that I like more than uh, another although. I, uh, when I was a kid, I really liked horror. I just watched horror almost exclusively. But again, that was partially or possibly mainly because in horror movies, you had a greater chance of seeing naked women <laughs> than in other movies. And I was pretty interested in that when I was a teenager. And it hasn't really changed that much, to be honest. Um, I kind of miss that in the old school movies, you know. And new mo recent movies don't really have a lot of nudity anymore. And it's, you know, I think they're, they're worse off for it, personally. And... Uh, so, yeah, I don't know, like uh, all the big ones, you know, Terminator 2, Aliens, those types of movies. The original Alien was fantastic. Uh, so some of the big genre movies um, I really liked. Um, but, yeah, I mean, more recently, yeah, it's getting less and less. I just don't see Hollywood mm. producing a lot of favourites anymore, you know. They're, they're, there's movies that I like, but, but none that where I go, yeah, okay, that's replaced Terminator 2 as my favourite movie of all time. Okay. But, yeah, I mean, on, on, on the topic of the movie industry in general... I think at the end of the day, there's something uh, behind that that motivates me. Like, obviously, uh, these are rant reviews, so they're fairly aggressive. And I try to um, personify the anger that I feel with really bad movies. But I generally review movies that should have been better, right? So a lot of people suggest to me, why don't you review Plan 9 from Out of Outer Space or something like that? And I'm like, I guess I could, but why is that funny? It's, you know, like... Plan 9 from Outer Space, because of the budgetary constraints and stuff, had no right to be a good movie anyway. Mm. You know, it was just done cheaply with cheap effects and it wasn't, it didn't have a lot of money behind it. So they weren't trying to make a good movie. But something like Iron Man 2, I just go, you know, fuck those guys. What the <laughs> hell was going on there? Like, and I don't mm. blame Jon Favreau, uh, you know, for directing it poorly because he was pushed into it by the studio. And the whole backstory is just studio interference and it's all about money, 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 get the movie out faster because Iron Man was such a big success. And it was it was ruined, you know? I mean, there were some good elements to the movie. They tried as hard as they could, but it was basically, you know, nowhere near the level of the original Iron Man, which was a very thoughtful, simple, um, and exciting movie to watch because it was so grounded in reality. And then they just sort of abandoned it all. Mm. Yeah. So I sort of have a thing like, I feel like doing negative reviews, we can learn from history in a way and send a message to the film industry that these things are mistakes and they need to, this is the type of thing they need to change to get the audience back on side. You know, it's, it's not quite a movement, but maybe one day I can make a <laughs> movement out of it, you know. Mm. But I feel like there is really a purpose behind it because, you know, I, I feel like if people don't start screaming from the rooftops about these movies, um, even if it's something like Mad Max where everybody disagrees with my opinion on it or at least, you know, is a lot softer in their opinion on it, um, I still feel like you need to put your voice out there if you want to be heard and ticket sales aren't really the vote anymore because there's so many ways to see these movies without buying a ticket, um, you know, getting it on, on DVD later or downloading it illegally, which of course I would never do, but, you know, I've heard some of the kids do that sometimes. 
Um, so yeah, like you don't really get a vote unless you're buying a movie ticket. And even then it's not really the primary way they judge a movie anymore. So I feel like it's partially, this is my vote or at least, uh, you know, it, it, no one's, no one's really listening right now, but maybe when someone's listening, it will be a vote. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with all of that. Um, uh, losing my train of thought here. I do think uh, negative uh, reviews have their own, like, uh, use uh, where, you know, it can be, like, really funny just to butcher a bad movie, but at the same time, you learn a lot of stuff from it. And I think a lot of uh, casual, maybe, movie fans who, like, have clicked on enough YouTube uh, reviews have learned certain things and go into movies a little bit differently. And, you know, um... I do think that's a problem, because every, like, uh, big budget movie, like a Sucker Punch, for example, which had a big budget, like, with all that money and all that talent, you could have done something, like, really special, and you could have made, like, yeah. or you could have made, like, a bunch of these low budget, uh, really, like, uh, entertaining movies, instead you just gave, like, a billion dollars to, uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. for Iron Man 2, so, there's unlimited potential that uh, movie studios uh, aren't doing because they want to make, you know, the most money. Well, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, it's if there's anything that lends credence to the conspiracy theories about the movie industry, to me anyway, it's the fact that movies like Sucker Punch get greenlit when other movies which probably have awesome scripts and, and would be fantastic movies can't get greenlit or can't get off the ground. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this is any kind of evidence, it's not, it's just a, like an indicator that, that changes the way I think. It's like, so Sucker Punch got made and that's a movie about a girl going through a traumatic experience and dissociating into a fantasy world and so on and so forth. And just so happens that there's a whole conspiracy theory about that's how uh, you know, the old CIA experiments from the 50s actually worked. They would actually traumatize victims and make them dissociate and they would become, they would create multiple personalities and then they could train those personalities to do different things, right? Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. There's obviously, there's some old documentation and stuff about MK Ultra experiments and so on. So there was something going on. They were trying to do that. Whether or not it worked is really the question. Um, but a movie like Sucker Punch is really a visual representation of the internal mind of somebody going through that experience, you know, the lobotomy and then being traumatized and raped and whatever was happening to her in that uh, asylum mm -hmm. and then going into a fantasy world. And as, as stupid as the fantasy world is, you know, those girls in the, um, what, what is that, the club that they work in or whatever, the prostitution den or whatever, those girls are, basically represent her alternate personalities. And if you know the theory of dissociation and multiple personality disorder and all that stuff, that's what the movie means. It's kind of obvious, in fact, that that's what the movie means. You know, it's, it's not necessarily that it's true. Maybe Zack Snyder just read conspiracy theories and wrote that movie based around the ideas. I don't know. But it lends credence because why would that movie get greenlit if that's what it's about? Like, Zack Snyder's not going to pitch that. He's not going to go, what we're going to do is expose the mind control experiments of the 50s uh, in a visual way and no one will get it. No one will understand it. It'll be awesome. And people will really not like it, but we'll have hot girls in it uh, doing action scenes, so it'll be okay. And they go, yeah, green light that, sure, yeah. So I don't understand it, but, you know, these movies, they do have a lot of weird references. They have satanic undertones and weird stuff. Well, the reasons for all that, I have no idea where it comes from, what it means, why they do it. But there are weird symbols and weird, um, you know, repeating themes in movies mm -hmm. that are definitely there. And they're, they're easy to see once you, once you know the basics. There's like, you know, three or four different symbols you need to learn, you know, like the butterflies are symbol, you know, the, the old, uh, you know, the one everyone knows, the eye inside the triangle thing, you know. I mean, once you learn those symbols, you do see them everywhere. So I don't know what it exactly means. And... I'm very uh, curious about it, but I'm never going to get an answer to it. So I just figure, you know, think about it, enjoy reading about it, enjoy thinking about it, and then park it. But don't make it part of your belief system or you'll probably turn crazy like every, like the conspiracy theorists with the tinfoil hats and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, th that's, that's a good philosophy. I like that. Uh, speaking of Zack Snyder, I don't know if you saw Batman v Superman. Have you? No, not yet. I, I actually just read so many reviews that said exactly what I was hoping it wouldn't be that I decided I'm not going to bother. Mm. Uh, it was uh, a very 
uh, like I everything I hoped it, it wouldn't like you said would happen and yeah. it kind of it was a very jumbled movie. Have you seen any like other movies this year so far? Uh, probably. I haven't really thought about what the, the, the my favorites have been, but um, I do live in the Philippines, so yeah. I, I get a very limited exposure to early release films. I think I'm getting um, I'm getting Captain America uh, this time next week. I think that's mm. is that the global release? I'm not sure. I I won't know. Um, I haven't checked it out. Yet. I, I, I'm. I'm very much looking forward to Civil War. I wasn't when I first heard about it. I thought maybe it was going to be too much of a mythology movie. Um, but again, the reviews that have come in, you know, I haven't watched many of them because I'm convinced by the trailers that I'll like it. But um, the reviews that I've, that I've read that were spoiler free uh, basically say everything that I want that movie to be. So I'm very keen to watch that uh, when it comes out. Mm. But yeah, I get pretty limited exposure. So I only really go to the cinema maybe once every couple of weeks, if that, a couple of mm. times a month. Mm. And, um, uh, I'm trying to think here. Uh, do you, cause a recent topic some of my friends and I have been talking about is kind of like been this, uh, like super boom of comic book movies where it's kind of become this trend, uh, but it's not really dying out as fast as trends usually go. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Just the super boom of comic book movies? Look, I'm honestly, I'm okay with comic book movies. Uh, there's good ones, there's bad ones. Um, mm. And I think the ones that I like tend to be the ones that, A, focus on character, building up good characters. I think the Marvel Universe is doing a really good job of building up the characters behind the crazy suits and abilities. Um, and I think keeping the abilities a little bit grounded, like I loved the first Iron Man because that was a guy building a suit with materials around him to escape a, uh, you know, a, a captive situation um, and then developing technology based around that because he can, he's a multi-billionaire. Same thing with Batman, right? Like he's got financial resources beyond anything we can imagine. So you can imagine him using technology to become you know, a superhero, having superpowers and so on. Mm -hmm. Where I have trouble is something like Thor, where I just go, oh, really? Like he's, he's an alien and, and considered a, you know, and he's like the source of all the god myths in, in the world. I don't know. I mean, that's probably where god myths come from. I don't know. But it's just, I didn't like, I didn't like seeing him on Asgard. I didn't see, I didn't like seeing him in, in, in such a foreign environment doing foreign things, talking to aliens. I just, you know, I didn't relate to any of them. Whereas, when he was on Earth, some of the some of the bits were okay, but he just didn't spend enough time there for me. Mm -hmm. So I like the ones that aren't too fantastical. Spider-Man's another one. Um, apart from the ridiculous scientific notion of getting bitten by a spider and becoming one, um, you know, they uh, once you get past that leap of faith, um, mm -hmm. you know, Spider-Man's just wearing a suit, and I especially like it when he's got um, artificial uh, web. What's that called? The the web slinger. Uh, uh, the yeah. thing that cr cr produces the web, um, which he seems to, I think, in the in the um, the Captain America movie, I think he's got artificial web slingers. Mm -hmm. um, I loved Spider Man. Uh, th there was a a movie that I saw on television in Australia back in the seventies, early eighties, I think, which was a, a Spider Man movie. I can't even remember what it was called, um, and it showed him, you know, lovingly making the costume and 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 putting a liquid inside the web slingers that would that would liquefy you know that would actually solidify as it shot out and there was like a scientific basis and i loved that when i was a kid and then he went out and he was like testing the suit for like 20 minutes of the movie where he was like trying to work out how to use it effectively and how to climb walls and how to not fall and that stuff i loved same with the the newer spider-man the sam raimi one um you know the sam raimi trilogies uh, that first movie where he was testing his abilities, and it, there was one scene that I remember really vividly where he was he was swinging crazily through the city, but you could see physically what he was doing because he was grabbing one particular piece of webbing and he was pulling on it, and then it would it would make him swing in that direction, mm. and it was really lovingly animated. And and if every single shot was animated like that, which probably they couldn't afford, but um, I would have loved that movie. As it was, it was. A little bit too crazy and zany, probably for my taste. Um, but I'm I'm softening on it, and I don't think comic book movies are the problem because comic book movies have very good source material. You know, they have crazy ideas, but if you can make that a little bit more grounded in a movie, it can work. 
Um, and they're very character based and very story based, even though, as I say, they're quite zany. So I don't think it's the comic book thing that's the problem because adapting a novel can be just the same, really. Like changing the source material isn't really going to change the movies. I think it's more just, you know, the way the industry is driven by profit and by previous success um, rather than innovation. And I want to see movies that I've never seen before. As I said, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I've never seen a visual representation of someone having their memories erased like that. It's it's amazing. It's just so well done. You know, Pi as well, the Darren Ar Aronofsky movie that I mentioned. Again, just I'd never seen anything like it. It just blew my mind. I came out of the movie feeling like I knew stuff that I didn't know before. Um, and I'll never get that from a comic book movie, I don't think. Hmm. But I can get a decent story and characters and so on. And I think if Captain America Civil War is as good as it looks, you know, that's an example of a comic book movie that should be made. But um, I, from what I know of Batman vs Superman, um, I would have probably preferred that they'd just left that alone or at least not wasted the idea on a bad movie because I'm sure it could have been good. Mm, uh, I feel the same way. It's like, as far as trends go, uh, the new superhero boom is like not the worst thing that could happen. There's a lot worse of trends in movies. Um, uh, do you, like, and there's there's been a lot of like comic book movies I really enjoyed, like V for Vendetta, I thought was like an amazing oh, yeah. movie. Uh, Love that movie. Yeah. Um, I asked you some of your favorite movies. Do you have movies that are like some really bad ones that you're looking forward to do a review for? Well, I have an entire list. I've probably got over 100 movies on the list of things that I could possibly review. I and the process worry. is basically um, I pick, I do six in, in a batch. So the first six, I pick them all out in advance. And that's just so that I can be a bit more efficient with creating them. So if I see something that's relevant to a movie, I know I'm going to review in six weeks time, I can you know, download that piece of uh, asset or whatever I need. Um, it makes it a little bit quicker knowing in advance, but generally I focus on one at a time. Um, and oh, I don't know, I, I'm looking forward mainly to doing more stuff to Gwyneth Paltrow than mm -hmm. particular movies. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably just go on to Gwyneth Paltrow's IMDB page and find the movies I hate the most that she's ever done, which is basically all of them. You know, Shakespeare in Love comes to mind. I, I can't wait to do that because she actually gets naked in that, which is just horrific. And I did not want to see that. It's, it's, like, it's like watching a you know, bad car accident where someone gets cut in half or a, you know, a baby dies or something. It's just, uh, you know. Anyway, I, I, you know, I, the only reason I haven't done that, it's, it's not on the slate at the moment because I do not want to watch that nude scene again. And that's the problem with doing this type of review is I have to watch movies that I really genuinely dislike. Uh -huh. And it takes me a while to work up to it sometimes. You know, I, I'll procrastinate for a couple of days because I don't want to watch the movie again. Mm -hmm. You know, Jupiter Ascending was like that. I, I just didn't want to watch it again. I just remembered how mind-numbingly dull it was and how frustratingly hit, you know, how, how it just missed the point of itself all the time. And I feel like a movie like Jupiter Ascending, it takes away from a movie like The Matrix because it proves the creators aren't the geniuses that they seem to be. And I hate that because I do associate the movie with the author. And I know the Wachowskis made The Matrix and they wrote it. And yes, the, there's the whole lawsuit thing going on. I don't know if you know about it, but they've been sued a couple of times about stealing scripts and ideas from other movies. I, I don't mind that because I think that's how... That's how movies, you know, it's how stories work. They're collaborative. You know, you always steal bits and pieces from other stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, actually making the movie and generating, you know, getting someone to invest, you know, $100 million or whatever that movie cost, uh, and then actually going out and shooting it, you know, the script's a pretty small part of that. So if they stole the script, I'm not too worried about it. But maybe that's why they can't repeat it. Maybe they can't find a script to steal that's as good. Um, again, Jupiter Ascending, why, w why would they make that movie if it didn't mean something, uh, you know, to the people who were funding it? I, 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 don't, I can't imagine reading that script and saying, yeah, that, that sounds good, yeah, make that. I can imagine going, oh, the Wachowskis are good, but even at that point they weren't doing that well. They'd had a couple of flops. Uh, even their good movies, like you said, V for Vendetta, which they only produced, but it did feel like a Wachowski movie. Mm -hmm. um, didn't do that well at the box office, I believe, you know. It's become a cult favourite, but it's... You know, it's successful with fans, but it's not, 
it wasn't a huge success as far as financial for the studio. So I don't know, but I, you know, it, it really makes me wonder how these things get, get green lit. Um, so yeah, sorry, the original question was, are there movies I'm looking forward to reviewing? Yeah, there's a bunch and most of them have Gwyneth Paltrow in them. Mm, you, you sound like you just have like the best uh, personal hate relationship with her. <laughs> just how, in, I just, how in detail you've already got it uh, is great. She's just a good example of a pretentious Hollywood, you know, loser who does not does not deserve anything that she's getting. She's she has the opportunity because of her family. You know, her father's like a famous producer or whatever, big shot in Hollywood. So she became an actress, and she looks a little bit like Mia Farrow, I guess. You know, she's got that look. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's the certain stars that have that look that become these these Hollywood sort of iconic actresses. And I think it's because I don't know the you know the I, maybe it's because the crazy elites have some kind of uh, fetish for a particular you know look a blonde blue eye kind of look you know the, I, I don't know what it is but I, I'm pretty sure they're probably all you know insane and weirdly uh, obsessed with things so whatever it is uh, these types of stars keep coming up and they're just I don't know they don't do anything for me I mean Gwyneth Paltrow think about her voice. Like acting, I think is is at least fifty percent voice, right? It's what you do with your voice that counts. Mm -hmm. And I learned this because coming from Australia, it's kind of interesting because a lot of our actors they start off in Australia doing local television and you know really dodgy sort of weird roles, small roles, and and they become celebrities in Australia, but it would never go anywhere else in the world. And then they go to Hollywood and they get this big break. And the you know Eric Banner is a great example where he did one movie that was really good in Australia called Chopper. Um, which was portraying a, a famous Australian criminal, and he just did an awesome job. Before that, he was on a really dodgy comedy show, doing comedy skits, you know, but not like Saturday Night Live, not classy comedy skits, really low-budget, crappy comedy skits. He had a, uh, a character named Poida, which was like how you say Peter when you're speaking in Australian slang, and he would just say really dumb stuff. And so watching him come through Hollywood, right, as soon as he went in, I think... I guess it was Black Hawk Down was the first big movie that he did in Hollywood that made him famous. And he, was, he said this, all this deep voice and this American accent and, you know, this gravelly look and he grew a beard and became all serious and heroic. And uh, I think like 90% of, of his success is the fact that he learned to do that voice. It's not his voice. Uh, it's kind of like, I guess, my videos. That's not really my natural voice. It's my voice if I was really, really angry which is, you know, I have to make an effort to maintain that voice, whereas my normal voice is a lot more, uh, you know, nasal and uh, boring. Mm. So um, Eric Banner's like that. If you hear him speak in interviews, he's really not that, that lively, but, uh, but he does the voice. Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't know, but um, Gwyneth Paltrow's voice, if you listen to it, she's just, she just sounds like, like if a weasel could speak that's what it would sound like. Uh, one, taking it back to the whole Jupiter Ascending thing, um, her character was supposed to be this really relatable, toilet scrubbing character who, you know, eventually, <laughs> who eventually obviously yeah. got like her boyfriend to take her on this grand adventure that no one will actually ever go on. But but the point is, Mila Kunis doesn't look like your average person. She really doesn't. She's like. Uh, supposed to be like uh, the hottest woman of whatever year and all this other stuff and it's like I know that uh, companies you know they gotta hire these big profile uh, actors because you know they want as much money as possible but it's like on terms of story sometimes you gotta make that higher leap like on um, and sometimes you know I feel uh, personally, like, with the new Star Wars movie, where I didn't recognize the actors right away, it, like, uh, m made me feel a little bit more immersed in the story. Yeah, that's true, that's true, but at the same time, I criticized Alice in Wonderland for having an un unknown actress who's very bad. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not, not very bad, it's probably unkind. I was pretty unkind to her saying that her chin looks like a penis, but I, I <laughs> thought that was really funny, so I had to put it in. Yeah. But no, I mean... Uh, you know, I don't like to criticize physical appearance too much because I'm, I'm absolutely no Brad Pitt myself and, you know, I probably shouldn't. But, um, yeah, I, I guess it can work, you know, uh, and, and it can work well. Daisy Ridley's a great example where she's no beauty queen. 
Um, but she's extremely charismatic somehow. I don't know even how she gets it across. She doesn't do anything that you can sort of, you know, write a list of things that she does well that make her likable, but she's just likable and relatable. You know, it's that movie magic thing, I guess, that they mm. talk about the, uh, that, that some actors have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it can, it can be hit and miss. I think, mm. you know, the studios have to bank on big stars, but if you've noticed lately, there aren't many left. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can bank on, you know, there's a lot of big stars like say Bruce Willis, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you can't bank on Bruce Willis anymore. I mean, he'll get some people into cinemas, but uh, he's not a guaranteed hit just because he's in the movie. Um, and, and the studios are panicking. They have no idea what makes a movie a hit anymore. They, they used to just be able to put George Clooney in it and pair him with some actress he hasn't had sex with on screen before. Mm -hmm. And that was enough. And people had just flocked to the cinemas and now I don't know what's happened, but the movie audience has become, uh, it's shifted somehow, it's changed and, and evolved. And, uh, you know, I think become smarter, I would say. I think, mm. you know, this whole thing about it being sort of a, a message to, you know, Hollywood and, and I, I shouldn't blame Hollywood, the whole movie industry, the global movie industry, you know, it's not like Chinese movies are any different. Um, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's the message, you know, and I think it's not just coming from me alone, I think a lot of people are feeling the same where they're getting jaded with movies because they're getting too much of the same thing. Mm. You know, and I think they're blaming the wrong things. I don't think blaming comic books is, a, is I mean, yes, there are way too many of them and, and they're not all going to be good. But I think using comic books as source material is fine, but it's the lack of innovation that's the problem, you know, yeah, and exactly. I don't know, you know, Bat Bat Batman versus Superman. Uh, from what I know, I mean, I've read the spoilers. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about spoilers. Do you do spoilers on this? Uh, I mean, I can. We can just say spoilers and then just skip whenever. So you go for it. Yeah. Okay. Or you, you can cut it out. But the fact that Superman dies in it, when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's a brave choice. And I nearly considered going to see the movie. Oh. And then I found out that it ends with implying that he's not dead. And I'm like, yep. well, that's you know, you, was, you've undermined it. So. Yep. Yep. I was the same way. Like literally, I was like. I was, I was like, for like pretty much the first time in that movie, uh, minus like cool action scenes, like impressed. I was like, I was like, okay, we don't necessarily need Superman anymore. But then it was just like, and then they, they went full out. Like, you know, he had the funeral. He had uh, yeah. people crying over him. He had two funerals. I'm sorry. He had like the big one and then he had one just on the farm. Uh, right. Yeah, and then we, we had Batman and Wonder Woman, like, his death meant something. And I know, like, in the original yeah. comic book, you know, he um, survived, and comic book readers know he'll survive, so I don't see the point in making it... You could have just had him die, and, like, his death would have meant something, but just implying that he's still alive, the casual audience is going to be like, oh, well, okay, and then the comic book people are going to be like, yeah, I already knew that, so... I don't, I, yeah. I don't like that decision. And, um, one thing I wanted to Well, know it's, it's, it's just making a chump of the audience because, yeah. you know, it's saying you're dumb enough to believe he's dead and then, haha, we were just kidding. I don't like it either. I mean, I like, I like a good twist, but yeah. it has to be done intelligently and it has to be done in a way that you can say to the audience, you could have seen that coming had you, had you realized how the story was going, mm. you know, uh, you know, like Sixth Sense is a good example where you can watch that movie a second time. And the twist is like, it's almost like they're screaming it from the rooftops. It's like, oh, obviously mm. no one says a word to him the whole movie. And they painstakingly yeah. make sure that that's the case. Exactly. And there's no, there's no point in that movie where someone can go, ha ha, he, he can't be a ghost because look, that happens, you know? And some people have tried, they go, oh, um, you know, he reached for the bill and his wife takes the bill or something like that. It's like, no, he never touched the bill. She could have not known he was there, but she didn't, mm. you know? So yeah. they were very careful. Yeah. Whereas, you know, something like this, it's not a twist, it's a fake out. It's a different thing. Mm. Uh, yeah. So same, same thing with The Walking Dead recently, right? Yes. With, uh, I was pretending, just pretending how many times did Glenn almost die? You know, like we thought he was exactly. dead for four episodes. Then they bring him back and then they have a cliffhanger where all the walkers are around him. It's like, come on, either Glenn's dead or he's not. But please just, you know, have a bit of uh, respect for your audience. We're watching a show here. There's more to it than just cliffhangers and and you know we're watching for the characters and the story and seeing how they evolve and we're more interested you know if glenn uh, learns something new than we are if he's dead or alive if he's dead fine you take him out of the show he's you know his his contract's probably up it's fine but which they you know they might he's one of the candidates for someone who may be leaving the show next next season 
Mm, uh, I agree. Like it's it seems like lately uh, there's been like studios pressuring this whole live and die thing because you know TV shows like Game of Thrones and Walking Dead. You know the loudest voices on social media and stuff are talking about, oh my God, so and so died, uh, and then the studio's like, oh, this is what people care about. And it, when you start saying, oh, so and so has to die. You start having characters in a show like Breaking Bad or Walking Dead. A character is going to die, but a character has to die for a reason that will fit within that story. You can't just have a, a big main A-list character die and then it's just like, oh, be sad. You have to, there has to be closure. And it, I feel like shows like The Walking Dead have stopped having closure. And it's... Uh, yeah, because, because they don't know how long it's going to go. So they have to keep the story rolling and they can't have any finality in any of the storylines mm. except for individual characters who they can then kill off. You know, I think Lost was a good example when originally they wrote Lost uh, so that they were going to cast Matthew Fox and have him die in the first episode. And that would have been cool. But can you imagine how different the show would have been and how much that proves they really didn't have a plan for it at that point? Which they admit, but they didn't. You know, that mm -hmm. the, we're going to just kill off this thing just for shock value. You know, get an A-list. Well, I don't know if he's A-list, but A-list yeah. for TV, maybe. Yeah. Or I, I just real um, quick, I haven't seen Lost, so don't spoil it for me. Well, that's the first episode, so you don't need to worry. Oh, I no, won't tell I, you I how just, it ends. But I'm yeah. just saying before you <laughs> jumped into it. Yeah, I was obsessed with Lost when it was on, but uh, I'm over that now. Let's just say the, uh, the finale, while I liked... I could enjoy it on one level. I just felt it didn't service the rest of the show very well. So mm -hmm. if you are going to ever watch Lost, and it, it's a, quite a marathon, just beware it may not end in a satisfying way yeah, for I've, you. Yeah, I've been uh, told. I, I've heard. Yeah. Uh, speaking of TV, uh, I know like your channel is dedicated to movies, and mine is like a multimedia channel. Is there any like just specific shows you're really into or music you're really into? Uh, not really. I, I've, I've kind of dropped out of music. I, I just, uh, I don't know what happened actually. I was very interested in music for a while and I, you know, I liked, I liked angry music like uh, Nine Inch Nails and things like that. Um, and I still do, but I just don't, there's, it's not integrated with my life anymore. So I don't really have time when I listen to music. Mm. When I did, I was on buses a lot or flying around on planes and things like that. Times when really listening to music is all you can do or it's a way to pass the time. Yeah. Um, but my lifestyle at the moment, there is no time passing anymore. It's, you know, I've always got something to do and a, a long list of things to do. You know, I mean, even if I was just doing videos for YouTube, I could fill up my time with that. So, um, I should, I should just play music in the background, but I don't, uh, TV, uh, you know, I'm watching Lucifer. I'm not sure I like it, but I'm watching it. You know, my girlfriend likes it. We watch it together. Uh, Walking Dead. Um, but I don't watch a lot of TV. I, I sort of, um, Around the time when the X-Files was really, really popular, so I don't know what, what, what year was the X-Files, it would have been around you know, 2000, a long time ago. I, um, I remember having a, an epiphany where I came home from school and I, uh, <laughs> and I was just waiting for the X-Files to come on, you know, or I just recorded it or something like that, or I, I had to set the VCR. And I remember neglecting something important while I was doing it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, I, TV seems to be, because it's scheduled for you, it seemed to me it was ruining my life <laughs> to an extent. I was following maybe five or six different shows only, so I wasn't a TV junkie or anything, but, but I had to get home at a certain time. I had to be there. I, I had to set the VCR or the, you know, uh, the re DVD recorder or whatever it was in those days. You know, I had to do all these things, and I thought, you know, if I just let go of TV as a concept, I'd get a lot of time back. You know, I get my life back. Mm. So I kind of did. So i never saw the end of the X-Files. I don't know what happens at the end of the X-Files, which is bizarre because I love the show. Um, and uh, I generally just watch things that I can watch on demand. Um, and I, I pick a number of shows, usually two concurrently that I can watch. And I just watch those. And I don't pay a lot of attention to other things. I, I tried Game of Thrones and I didn't like it, which is weird because there's a lot of nudity in it. You know, that should be something <laughs> that I liked. But yeah. but I, I just got a bit bored with, I don't like that sort of serious acting thing where everybody speaks in a strange accent and acts like everything's important. Mm. You know, I like a bit of, of 
naturalness to the characters and I didn't feel that Game of Thrones had that. It might get it later, but I think I got about four episodes in and said, you know, not really worth my time. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, not a great deal of TV, but I, um, you know, there's a, there's a few that I follow. Uh, one thing I, I, I was going to mention, but I forgot, taking it back to that, uh, uh, the voice acting is like, you know, half the work for uh, acting, right? Um, yeah. You, we see that even like uh, on YouTube, you uh, put on a, a sort of, I guess, angry voice. Uh, my voice now is how I normally talk, which is kind of monotone, and I don't really like my voice all that much. But when I do a review, I try to <laughs> I try to do something with it, and I try to sound a little bit more upbeat how I'm talking like right now. Um, and you know, other friends of mine, I have a friend named Keith. He does a voice. Uh, there's this girl named Eden. I know she does like horror on her channel and like her voice isn't uh necessarily scary and she has to work that way in a unique way um yeah and like uh, even just like i remember i saw the revenant uh recently and leo like because uh, he does voices too pretty often and his uh voices yeah. in that movie just he is oh i don't want to say overacting but he is uh going for it did you see the revenant yeah Oh yeah. It was, yeah, I did see it. Yeah, I saw it quite recently actually, just a week ago. Yeah, that was uh a performance. Do you think he should have won the Oscar cuz I've uh, had a conversation about that? Uh No. All he did was suffer for that Oscar. It mm -hmm. wasn't the acting, I don't think. I look, I've got no problem with the movie. Um I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. I think for what it was, it was pretty good and obviously the uh the visuals in in some of the the key scenes were amazing. Yeah. Um, and very disturbing. I, 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 as it's strange as a horror fan, but I get very upset with realistic violence in movies. I get quite traumatized, and that that really got to me. There's a couple of shots where, you know, yeah. he gets really badly injured, and you can really see it happen, and you can feel it, you know. And I think that's great, but that's nothing that that Leonardo DiCaprio did, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, he was probably just you know, lying on a fake ground, rolling around randomly, and the rest was done in post-production. So I don't give him a lot of credit for that. He did manage to look very hurt and sick. And, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, he, he did that well. But again, some of that's makeup, some of it's, uh, you know, lighting and camera work and all that stuff. So definitely not, I think, Oscar worthy. And I, I hate to say it because I think Leonardo DiCaprio is a great actor and he yeah. probably has done things that are Oscar worthy. Same. Um, I just don't think he should have got it for this particular one. I just don't think there was as much for him to do other than be cold. <laughs> and it seems like, I, we'll put it this way, if they hadn't put out the news stories about how hard it was to shoot that movie, would he have still won the Oscar? I don't think he would have. I think it was because people knew how hard it was and how much they suffered, the fact they were really on location and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think knowing that made them go, wow, yeah, that's great acting then. Mm -hmm. That and like this huge internet audience who is just like make Leo win. Uh, I think yeah, that, that too. Yeah, I think that they just finally were like, okay, we'll just give it to him. And um, you yeah, know, yeah, the movie itself, like um, I was gonna like do a, a review for it because I was genuinely like super excited. But when I watched it, like uh, it was a good movie. Like it did a lot of interesting stuff visually. But like I didn't know like because even uh, what's his name. The guy, uh, I'm, I'm, I hate myself. I'm forgetting his name. The guy who played Bane, uh, Tom Hardy. Uh, even he, he's Tom Hardy. Yeah. yeah, he's doing a voice. Leo's doing a voice. Uh, you know, the pacing was kind of weird. I fell asleep for it, and by the end, I was just like, I don't even know what I'll say about this movie. Uh, so, <laughs> like Tom, Tom Hardy's accent was so weird. His voice was so weird that I couldn't really understand what he was saying a lot of the time. And yeah. he seems to have a habit of doing that where he pushes the accents. You know, he wants to be a character actor so much that he forgets you have to actually enunciate your words or people will audible. not understand you. Yeah, same with Bane, but I guess that was like kind of electronic, uh, his voice there. But, um, or at least it had that like, oh, the voice and the boo. Uh, yeah. yeah, did you enjoy The Dark Knight Rising? Uh, pretty... I, I liked... Um, what was the second one called? The Dark Knight? Or just... Yeah, yeah, that's right, because they're almost the same. Yeah, no, I, I like the second Batman a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, the third one, I it didn't... I wanted to. I was with it. I paid attention to it. I didn't get bored. Uh, but I didn't feel the, 
the underlying themes were as satisfying. I think the second movie had a real focus on what it was about mm. and it was interesting. Whereas I think the, yeah, it was just a bit muddy and weird and it's almost like they had to shoehorn in certain elements because the studio demanded it, which could possibly be the case. I haven't actually researched whether or not there was a lot of studio interference, but it mm. just, it felt like there was some and I don't know, it just, not all of it was good. Uh, for me, I, I like the character of Bane. I like that first action scene where he's in the plane and uh, and and you know hijacks the plane and and cuts it in half and <laughs> all that stuff. That was amazing the way it looked. It was fantastic and very um, tense because it was very uh, you know realistic. You could feel yourself in the moment. But no, I liked bits of it. But you know, I was a bit disappointed. Mm, I like I keep like whenever people ask me, I say you know I liked it because I remember really liking it. But at the same time. It's been a little while, but I don't even really remember a lot of it. And as far as yeah. The Dark Knight, you know, I've seen it a good amount now. But the first time, I, between the first time I saw it and the second time, there was a lot. Uh, there was a couple years there. But by the time, the second time I saw it, like, I still remembered everything. I remembered, like, specific lines the Joker said. I remember uh, the specific scenes. I remember that bank robber scene. Like, uh, the ending. The ending, like, just... Uh, the, the, the hero, yada, yada, yada. Like, it was a much more memorable movie. Uh, oh, I think, I think that's a good way to judge a movie, too. I think on, on um, whether or not you remember it. I think there's certain movies that you can watch that are enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And you remember that you enjoyed it. But then when you try to remember a specific scene or almost anything that happened, you get like a couple of flashes of, yeah, I think something happened in the end like this or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just not memorable. So... It's possible to be a good movie without being memorable, but I think memor memorableness, me memorability, I don't know, is there a word for it? Whatever the, whatever the word would be. Yeah, we can, can you just dub my voice over yeah. later? <laughs> <laughs> Saying it correctly. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's a good criteria. It's not the only one, but it's a good criteria. And I'm, I feel the same. I remember, uh, look, I remember every single moment the Joker's on screen. To be honest, if you remove the Joker, from the Dark Knight. Oh. I'm not sure how good a movie it is. Yeah. I think if I think they they got to mine an awesome character, and they got an awesome actor to do it. Again, another I think Australian actor who um, who went all Hollywood, which was uh, amazing. But he was unrecognizable. Like anyone who knows of Heath Ledger from uh, Ten Things I Hate About You. Did you see that movie? Oh my God, he's so different in that. Or uh, Brokeback Mountain. Yeah, I haven't very, actually seen that one, but yeah, it's I assume he's roles. very different in that. Yeah, very yeah. different roles. Like uh, people. But like... yeah, I think if you remove the Joker, is it a good movie? It's okay. Uh, I think it loses uh, most of its appeal, though. Quite a lot of its appeal. Yeah, uh, same. Uh, that's like just like by now, like it's only been out for like maybe uh, not even like a decade, like maybe eight, seven years. Uh, but it's already like uh, uh, like I don't want to use the word classic and. But it's pretty much a classic uh, movie in terms of like people quote it all the time and people really remember it and just the imagery can be seen and so yeah. many other stuff. And you know that um, that pencil trick that the Joker does is like uh, one of the most awesome things ever committed to celluloid. It's fantastic. Uh, I know, like, like literally the first time I saw that, it, it, like literally everyone was just like, "What the f like?" It was great. Um, I. I think if the Joker was in The Dark Knight Rising, then it like which I, he ninety percent ninety five percent chance that he would have been. Uh, I I honestly think that it could have made that movie a lot more. But at the same time, like that was such a good performance in The Dark Knight, and like if yeah. if the studio got too involved and was like oh recreate this scene but do it differently, I I don't want it to water it down. So maybe um maybe uh him not being in the third movie maybe there's some good stuff to that but uh we'll never know yeah definitely i mean i i, I think um uh jared leto is going to have a pretty interesting challenge doing the joker in suicide squad he seems to have gone in a very different direction which i think is the right choice but whether or not it'll be as good i don't know i mean he's portraying this character everyone loves and mm. uh, they've got a lot of expectation you know i don't know if he can win like no matter what he does he's a great actor obviously but uh I just don't know if he can win. Mm -hmm. um, I think I don't think he's gonna like do this amazing job. I think it's gonna kind of be like a 
what happened with, you know, Ben Affleck where everyone was like, he can't do this. And then the movie comes out and people are just kind of, you know, they're, they're genuinely just pretty happy with it. And, um, yeah. I think that's probably what's going to be happening. It's going to be, uh, not serviceable, but a good kind of serviceable. Like, oh, he did his job. We can move on. Uh, but you know, the discussion, it makes me think of something. Do you mind if I just, um, just take a tangent for a second? Oh, go for it. Cause this is something I've been thinking about recently where, um, you know, I spend a lot of time blaming, uh, Hollywood, the, the industry, whatever for bad movies. And I think the audience needs to take some responsibility mm -hmm. and here's why we're writing these movies and then criticizing them if they don't follow our script. Right. So we're saying, oh, Batman versus Superman. I know what I want this to be. And then we spend a lot of time imagining, you know, and they make they make the movie over two or three years. And we spend a lot of time imagining and talking about what could happen and all the cool stuff that's going to be in the movie and all this stuff. And then you watch the movie and you go, oh, it was different from what me and my friends planned it to be. The director didn't know all those ideas or whatever, you know, like as if as if the director should be sitting on Twitter all day, you know, like he shouldn't be busy making the movie. He should be listening to the fans and and there's there's an element of that some directors seem to do that quite well where they can they can actually get fan sentiment and roll it into the movie i think jj abrams did that really well with the force awakens but we should not be writing the movie and 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 even if we do it before we go in we need to take responsibility for the mindset that we have when we walk into the cinema and i think a lot of people don't do that and they go in and they say right play out the movie as I expect it to be and make sure you include these 17 different things that I want to see and then if it doesn't then uh, you get angry <laughs> you know like mm. as if they as if as if there's any way for the movie to be personally just for you you know so I think it's a bit of give and take where um, we need to turn our brains off right I, I my girlfriend's a good example I sit with her watching movies right and I sometimes because I'm a lot older than her I sometimes show her old movies that she hasn't seen, classic old movies, you know, Sixth Sense is one of the ones that we went through, right? And she's sitting there constantly trying to outsmart the movie and it really pisses me off. It's like, okay, if you outsmart the movie, who wins? You feel good that you outsmarted the movie, but you've ruined the movie for yourself, haven't you? So why don't you just stop trying to think about what's going to happen and watch the story, listen to what they're saying and let it play out. The movie mm. needs to tell you everything about it you shouldn't be telling the movie what it needs to be. And I think there's a, you know, there's two sides to the coin and, and there's a lot of uh, audience authorship, if you can call it that, going on at the moment. And you and I are as guilty as anyone else because we review movies. Mm. But I think doing it retrospectively isn't as harmful as doing it in advance of the movie. Yeah. You know, you can ruin the movie for a lot of people. And, you know, I know that I know the studios must be completely fearful of, of the pre-press that comes from things like Twitter about their movies, you know, before they've even made them or committed to particular things. So I, I think there's some give and take, you know, the audience has gotten a bit too smart for its own good. And we're very hard to please mm -hmm. as well. You know, I don't know how you feel about it, but I just feel like I hear a lot of people criticizing movies and it's not really fair to the person who wrote and directed the movie. Mm, no, I, uh, I agree with a lot of that. And um, my girlfriend, <laughs> she's kind of the opposite uh, where she like I really kind of almost envy her because the movies like Jupiter Ascending and uh, these other movies I've reviewed that are, were like pretty bad uh, like she like wants to see them and she's not, like not part of the sort of internet culture that's like uh, really wants to get on to bashing a movie and she likes some movies that some movies like that I think are just pretty downright bad but it's like um, I like enjoy the fact that she's enjoying the movie because uh, if she's yeah. enjoying the movie then I don't want to diminish that at all uh, and you know she's she completely understands why I hate some of her movies uh, uh, and I don't mean like because they're like female movies I mean movies like Jupiter Ascending or like uh, uh, what was another one uh, she like weird movies like Jaws so and so or like a weird like the fifth <laughs> sequel or some something like that, but um, you know, I I agree. Like, uh, there's like movies like I feel I feel like movies. You know, we start to expect um, what's gonna happen before they even happen. But part of that is the audience uh, demanding 
oh, we gotta have Wonder Woman in our movie. We gotta have, uh, we gotta, we gotta have, uh, jump scares so in the trailer we can show the audience, uh, reacting yeah. to the jump scare. Uh, there's all these things that, like, movies almost have to have, and once you do that, it becomes a formula. And, you know, once your formula, um, gets old, it's, it's not, uh, gonna be healthy for storytelling in general. So, yeah, that's, um, I completely agree with, um... Well, the movie's the movie's job is to take you on a journey and and give you a beginning, a middle, and an end, and let you follow the story. And it's it's just a communication medium. It just needs to tell you what's happening in the story, and who's feeling what, and it just needs to communicate visually and audibly to to get that across. But if you're if you come in with expectation, you have to take responsibility for the expectation. And if it ruins the movie, if if it you know a mismatch of expectation is the problem with the movie, then you got to take at least fifty percent of the blame that you didn't like it. If you'd gone in as a blank sheet, maybe it would be okay. Mm -hmm. um, one thing uh, off topic I want to say is I there whenever I talk to people who are like uh, do these kind of like negative movie reviews, they're either like this very sophisticated and I think uh, intelligent person like yourself, or they're just this sort of bashing like oh like negative nancy type of person so i'm glad you're a sophisticated gentleman uh with that being well i i love movies i love bad movies just as much as good ones you know for uh -huh. different reasons but i love talking about it so that's that's the main reason i chose to do this particular topic i could have probably done a lot of other topics but mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i i i hope that the reviews don't come across as too negative. The, the point is oh, to no. be funny, not yeah. to be critical. Yeah. I'm critical, but but I hope, like, I, there's no point in expressing a negative thought if it's not funny, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise it's just it's just negativity for the sake yeah. of it. So um, there'll be plenty of people who don't think it's funny, and I get that. They'll probably just think I'm some ranting, um, grumpy asshole, which is fine too. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't want people who, you know, sort of invest in it to think of that think of it like that and i am going to do some other content at some point uh that will be more positive as well just to balance it out a little bit because it does concern me mm, yeah i don't i didn't ever get that impression that it was like uh just to hate on some i like i said i was laughing a lot in the videos and there there's a point where like you can i can tell like how well constructed it is that you know what you're doing so i just kind of know like oh he's not doing this and, um, with I hope so. I, I take um, Ricky Gervais, uh, his, not necessarily his style of humor or anything, but his, his philosophy on humor, which is if it comes from a good place and someone gets offended, then the offended person is wrong. They're entitled to their opinion. But if you didn't mean something offensively mm. and they took it offensively, then that's just them being offended on their own and that's fine but it's not something that you should change what you're doing because of that. If someone gets offended because you said something really nasty and it really is negative and bad and you hurt someone or, you know, someone who's not a celebrity who'll never see the, hopefully never see the review. Anyway, like I'd, I'd be mortified if Gwyneth Paltrow ever rang me up and said, okay, let's, let's resolve this. You know, you and I, obviously we have a bit of beef going on. What can I do? You know, I'd be, I wouldn't know what to say. Like I, uh -huh. the idea of, of her actually seeing it is terrible but the the humorous thread of having someone that you really really despise uh, is is to me just too funny to pass up so i you know i i'm, I'm gonna continue to do it um mm. eventually i guess someone will probably tweet gwyneth paltrow <laughs> she might see one i don't know okay. that would be hilarious i yeah. guess hilarious for everyone except me yeah it, it, would, it would be great uh if once you do get to that nude scene and then i'm sure you're gonna criticize uh, it in a way that she wouldn't uh, appreciate so that would be that that would be a, a, a funny story if she ever contacted you um, yeah yeah we well we'll see if it, if it ever gets to that point I'm sure um, I'm sure I won't care about it as much as I do now anyway because uh, it would mean there's uh, you know there's more people watching the videos which would be uh, would be nice you know I don't I don't actually want a big audience but I it's kind of like talking to no one is also pretty depressing, mm -hmm. especially if you put a lot of work into the videos. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to have some kind of audience just so that you can say, okay, that really justifies doing it if, if it's, you know, if it's, if enough people are enjoying it. 
Mm. Um, I don't know how you feel. I mean, you've got a, about five times the audience that I do at the moment, as far as subscriber goes or whatever. Um, I don't know what's a good balance, but you know, I, I, I don't need millions of subscribers. I, I don't want to be one of those famous YouTubers. I'm too shy for that anyway. So uh, you know, I'm happy to have just a little niche and a, a few people that like talking to me about movies and, and just sort of have a community. Mm. So uh, yeah, but if it ever, if I, you know, you wouldn't want to be PewDiePie or something like that. I can't imagine what it's like having to get up in the morning and you know you have to record some video where you're funny and entertaining and and you're you know I guess I don't know do you do you get the sense I don't know about I think you're quite natural on camera when you do your reviews you were saying before you just do you know your regular voice and whatever for mm -hmm. me I I find it's like I, I'm doing a character essentially mm -hmm. someone who can have views that I don't necessarily have the conspiracy rant being a good example of that where I'm talking as if I believe all of those conspiracy theories and crazy stuff and crazy thoughts. And I'm not saying they're not thoughts that I haven't had or that I don't consider the possibility, um, but I don't necessarily believe every single crazy thing that I say in that. I, mm. I, I, the character does, you know, the, the part of my brain where that came from, where, where, who thinks that all conspiracy theories must be true, the, who doesn't have very good critical analysis, <laughs> is the guy that's speaking when I do that. So, you know, it's it's kind of interesting because I, I actually very specifically think of it as a character because I um, there's been a couple of influences on that. The main one was the Red Letter Media um, Mr. Plinkett reviews, which I'm sure you've seen some of the Mr. Plinkett reviews. Yeah, Have you seen them? Yeah, I've seen the yeah. Red Letter Media. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I, I love those guys and I, I watched their um, Plinkett reviews and I was like, wow, this is like so entertaining and that you know he's got uh women tied up in his basement and uh, all this crazy oh, stuff yeah i saw what yeah I, I saw the phantom menace review and it was it was that's, like that's the most famous one yeah wow while, while it's going on there's like this very very like fucked up story going on underneath so yeah that was great yeah, so for me that was a bit of an epiphany. I went, you know what, you you don't have to be yourself mm. in a video. You can you can play a character and people just relate to the character. They know you're probably not that character because I guess he would have police at his door if people really believed he was doing that. <laughs> but it's funny. People go with it because it's funny. They like the character. And then obviously later on Red Letter Media they do their um half in the bag show and they do other movie reviews and stuff. Um and they're themselves in those or give give or take. And, uh, and so he's revealed that he's playing a character, you know, like he's not even pretending like, you know, he's not even trying to maintain the illusion that there's a character or that there's not a character. And I find that a really interesting thing. And when I sort of worked that out, I was like, oh, so I could do a character instead of speaking like myself, which solves that problem that I had when I first recorded myself doing the review, that, that my voice was uninteresting. If I did anything other than that, I would feel uh, fake, you know. Mm -hmm. I would feel like I was forcing being interesting and I don't like that either. I find when, when YouTubers do that, it's very distracting and you can tell uh, that they're not being genuine. You know, you, you speak louder and you enunciate and you do all those things, but it needs to come from you. Otherwise people see it, you know, it gets magnified in the video. Mm. So I just went, okay, I'm going full character with this. I'm going to do a, a particular voice uh, and I'm going to maintain the voice. And even to the point where um, I watched my original Aeon Flux review, um, because I, I, I actually shot, I think, four or five before I released the first one. So I had a sort of a stock of them. Um, and I actually watched the Aeon Flux one before I was about to release it. And the voice was different. I'd used a different microphone and I didn't quite have the, you know, the tone of it nailed at that point. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't angry enough. It just didn't sound angry. Um, so I went back and re-recorded that one when I released it. So actually Eon Flux was a more recent recording than the four that followed it, I think, or the three that followed it. Uh, yeah, I think like any YouTuber that, uh, even the ones who aren't even on camera, any YouTuber to an extent is kind of playing a character because you're talking as if you're talking to a wider audience. And every time they turn on the camera, they're thinking, Who's gonna? My friends are gonna be watching. Uh, my family's watching. These random people I don't know, who for all I know could be like the worst people or the best people ever. They're all watching. So to an extent, uh, I, 
I don't necessarily act like how I'm, I'm just talking to you right now, but if I'm on camera, I'm talking as if a lot more people are watching and I, to an extent, um, say things I don't actually mean for the purpose of comedy. And I, I do think uh, every YouTuber, to an extent, plays a character. And it's like, there are certain things like uh, when you're on camera, you're, you're not going to talk as if like how I'm talking to you. You're going to talk in an ed a format where you're going to be edited in a format you know how you're going to deconstruct later in a computer. And that's not going to be a genuine yeah. uh, like conversation. I I've made videos where I've just talked to myself in a camera. But even those where I'm like probably the rawest form I'm going to get, I I'm still a guy talking into a camera by himself and then waiting uh, knowingly i'm going to spread that out to the world so uh there there's a form there's a format uh like you where you kind of get to play a character which i i i've thought of doing that i just don't know a creative way i could incorporate a character into my reviews so that's why i chose not to do that or you could do it like me yeah. where i'm just uh more energetic and a uh, form of myself and I act a certain way so th th there, there are certain ways that can work and um I, I like your style too it's not that this, this was just the only way I was comfortable with to be honest I you know if I was just talking as myself I wouldn't have enjoyed my own videos so I figured if I don't enjoy it who's going to mm -hmm. um you know there's a, probably a lot of people who'll have a negative reaction to the ranting style as well I, I have a friend who um, I used to make short films with, and we were very close. We used to be neighbors. Um, and he doesn't watch them. He says, it's just not for me. I just don't like that YouTube rant thing. You know, I just don't enjoy it. I'm not going to click like on your videos. I'm not going to do anything to support you. Oh, I was like, yeah, okay. I go, That's, I understand. I'd actually rather you do that as a friend than just support me without liking it, like my mother would potentially, you know. So yeah. uh, I, I don't mind that. I think, you know, some people like it, some people don't. I think most people relate more to a more genuine persona on camera like yours mm. um, I think I do in general but there's sometimes when there's a character that works really well like Mr. Plinkett and I go it can be successful and it's the only way I'm comfortable doing it I'll try I'll try doing it that way and see if it works out mm -hmm. and I'm okay with it so far you know I, I, I'm I'm almost certain if I found Popcorn Lobotomy and I'd never heard of it I would subscribe to it and probably watch the reviews. I'm not sure, but I think I would. Mm -hmm. um, and I figure there's there's got to be there's got to be some other people who are interested in that type of thing. Plus, there's the um, you know I write it pretty carefully as well. So you know I I try to make sure it doesn't repeat itself too much because there's a real danger of doing the same jokes over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and and I you know I I don't like repeating myself. So I you know it's something that would annoy me if it was doing that. I think too much. Um, it is essentially the same joke over and over again in the format, but it, you know, I try to mix it up enough that it's, uh, you know, that the reviews are saying different things. Mm -hmm. um, so I figure, even if you didn't like the voice, you might, you might still want to listen to the content, or, uh, you know, I try to fold in some some pictures of hot girls occasionally and things like <laughs> that too, just for for <laughs> the guys that are interested to the, in that. You know, I, I haven't put one in a thumbnail yet though, so hopefully I have some integrity <laughs> left. Yeah. Um... Yeah, going back to what you said earlier, like I have uh, friends who have told me, hey, I'm not going to watch all your reviews because maybe I just like movies or I just like games. I'm like, dude, don't don't worry about it, uh, because if uh, if you if, if you're just because I because I like to hear their feedback. And if you're giving me just a feedback of, oh, yeah, it was uh, it was great. Everything was great. Then that's not going to be the feedback of an average person uh, watching no. the video. And um, with that being said, we've been going for about 90 minutes, so I think that was, that was a good point. Oh, yeah. That was a good stopping point. Um, is there any final thoughts you want to give? Uh, no, but I just wanted to say, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing, because I really enjoy your, uh, your videos. I watched your, um, what was the most recent one, the game, the 8-bit game that you played? Uh, yeah, two. And I had, I had no interest in it based on the title. I just watched it because we were starting to uh, do this podcast and I thought I'll just uh, refresh myself what you sound like and watch your most recent stuff so I've seen it and I found it really interesting the way you talked about that game and the way the story dragged you in despite the visuals being really poor mm -hmm. and uh, yeah no good stuff I mean just keep doing what you're doing because I really enjoy it as it is and if it doesn't work out you can always 
take a career being a Sam Rockwell impersonator, <laughs> as I've said before. I think you're a dead ringer for a young Sam Rockwell. You could probably play his younger self in a movie if he ever gets a franchise like Indiana Jones or something uh, and they want to do prequels. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. It yeah. could work out for you either way. Yeah. Uh, you're the... Like, I've heard some uh, comparisons of how I look and some of them aren't good. Like, uh, when I was in high school, people said, you look like uh, Edward from Twilight. And I was like, that's not something I'm going for. And, um, I, and, <laughs> and I, I enjoy the fact that you like that video because, uh, you know, some people only watch certain videos. And I, I enjoy, like, certain people who have told me, like, oh, I just watched it for your, like, movie reviews, but that music thing you reviewed really got me into that, like, album. So I, yeah. I, I enjoy whenever I hear that. And I... Uh, I'm gonna have links to your channel down below and thank you for coming on. Uh, this was an awesome conversation uh, You yeah, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I I, I just want to tell you to anyone watching like seriously you have uh, a very like uh, Good format that I like really enjoyed and even if it's just your a niche market you're going for I I think I'm in that niche market like a hundred percent so uh Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. With that, guys, um, thank you for watching. And with that, we leave you.